This is more of a practitioner's panel uh, where we have three individuals who uh, either litigate or advocate uh, with regard to some of the religious liberty issues that we'll be discussing today. And because the panel is titled Emerging Religious Liberty Issues in Ohio, we actually want to stick to that and, and really talk about um, what are some of the, from a practitioner's type of perspective, what are some of the key issues that are either making their way through the courts or are working their way through the legislature uh, that can impact people who are concerned, um, for whatever reason, uh, about religious liberty issues. This, the religious liberty topic um, is really one that, in, in my view, um, is really close to the heart of, uh, not to be too um, you know, emotional about it, but it's close to the heart of what it means to be an American. Um, religious liberty is enshrined uh, right there in the First Amendment to the Constitution, but it's really an issue that is tied with our national identity even, uh, even before we get to uh, the constitutional debates in the, in the 1700s. Uh, if, <laughs> Every Thanksgiving, uh, we get together and we celebrate uh, basically what, what, the, what the pilgrims uh, went through and experienced in their quest uh, for religious liberty on these shores. So it's an important and, and uh, 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 core issue uh, that I think everybody has a stake in. Um, in, in the past, uh, in my view, uh, it, it's an issue that wasn't terribly controversial. Uh, we didn't have, I think, a lot of debates about religious liberty in, say, the 1990s. In fact, in the early 1990s, after Employment Division v. Smith, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which was relatively uncontroversial at the time. You had, uh, I don't think it was quite unanimous, but nearly a unanimous Congress that voted Republican and Democrat alike to pass that statute, and President Clinton, of course, signed it into law. In recent years, it's become more of a flashpoint, uh, certainly in our political debates. If you look at some of the big political issues that were at issue in the presidential debates in 2008, 2012, 2016, uh, these issues came up. Uh, we also um, are seeing more and more religious liberty fights in the courts. So with that background uh, to build off of, I want to introduce our three speakers. Uh, first. Um, Two down uh, to my left is Jeremiah Gallus. He serves as legal counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, one of the country's premier uh, public interest organizations uh, litigating in the religious liberty uh, space. He joined ADF in 2015, and he's a member of ADF's Center for Christian Ministries. In this role, he focuses on protecting the freedom of Christian ministries, schools, and churches to exercise their faith without government interference. Prior to joining ADF, Jeremiah worked as an attorney with Wiley Ryan in Washington, D.C., where he focused on complex civil litigation before state and federal trial and appellate courts. He also worked as a prosecutor for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office in Arizona. Jeremiah earned his law degree uh, from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law in 2009, where he was an editor of the University of Pittsburgh Law Review. He earned his bachelor's degree from Millersville University, and he was actually, uh, prior to working for ADF, uh, one of ADF's Blackstone Fellows. Uh, next to me, uh, directly to my left, is Philip Williamson. He's an associate at Taft's Titanius and Hollister in Cincinnati. He focuses his practice on litigation and specifically on appellate litigation. Prior to joining Taft, Philip served as a judicial law clerk to, this will take a minute, uh, Judge Raymond Kethledge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, for Judge Umul Thupar, now of the Sixth Circuit, but at the time uh, a judge of the Eastern District of Kentucky, and also uh, Judge Levinsky Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Uh, quite, a, quite a background there. Uh, Philip earned his bachelor's degree, uh, summa cum laude, from Wichita Baptist University and his law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law, where he was an editor of the Journal of Law and Politics. Philip has been awarded a, Marshall Fellowship, a John Marshall Fellowship uh, from the Claremont Institute Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence and also was a, a Blackstone Legal Fellow. He is also a board member uh, of our Cincinnati Lawyers Chapter and the newly forming uh, Con Northern Kentucky uh, Lawyers Chapter. Third, uh, all the way at the end of the table, uh, to my left, is Holly Gross. Holly is the Vice President of Government Relations for the Columbus Chamber of Commerce. She leads the Chamber's advocacy efforts at the local, state, and federal levels of government. She earned her undergraduate degree from The Ohio State University and her law degree from Capital University Law School here in Columbus. Prior to joining the chamber, Holly represented Ohio's retail industry uh, before the Ohio General Assembly as a legislative counsel for the Ohio Council of Retail Merchants. 
She also previously worked as the executive director of the Ohio Association of Convenience Stores and the Ohio Tire and Automotive Association, and is a legislative aide for the Ohio House of Representatives. Holly was named the 2018 Ally of the Year by Equality Ohio, and she serves as a board member of the PAST Foundation, which seeks to connect real-world scientific research with classrooms and the public. So thank you, uh, Jeremiah, Philip, and Holly, for joining us today. Uh, with this panel, uh, we want to explore several discrete issues uh, rather than one issue uh, the entire time. Uh, so I'll lay out first what those broad issues are, and we'll see the conversation where it goes. Uh, time permitting, what we hope to address is first, uh, Tree of Life Christian Schools for, versus Upper Arlington, uh, <coughs> City of Upper Arlington. It's a, actually a zoning case uh, involving religious liberty related claims brought under the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act uh, emerging from a zoning dispute just a few miles up the road in Upper Arlington. The Sixth Circuit held for Upper Arlington in that case, and Tree of Life Christian Schools has filed a cert petition with the U.S. Supreme Court, which is now being briefed. Second, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the ongoing debate over requests by religious groups or individuals for religion-based exemptions to statutes of general applicability. This debate has frequently emerged, especially in the last few years, in the context of debates over efforts in legislatures to pass uh, what's known as SOGI laws or, or sexual uh, orientation and gender identity uh, laws, including in Ohio. Third, we'll talk about Article 1, Section 7 of the Ohio Constitution, uh, which broadly speaking is the state version of the First Amendment. Uh, it has some language that differs actually from the text of the federal First Amendment. And therefore, um, I, know, I think Judge Sutton left, but I hope he's happy we're fleshing out <laughs> this topic a little bit today in this specific context. So we'll dive into it. Uh, as I said, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover topic by topic. Jeremiah, uh, with his role at a ADF, uh, has some insight into the Tree of Life case. So Jeremiah? Sure, yeah. Thank you for having me here today. Um, Tree of Life is for all you Relupa nerds out there, all three of you probably. Um, <laughs> But it's actually, it, it actually is an interesting case that involves um, <coughs> questions about religious discrimination and also statutory interpretation. Um, just some background on the facts of the case. Tree of Life is a Christian K through 12th school here in the Columbus area. And for the past eight years, they have owned a building that they have not been able to use. And the reason they haven't been able to use this building is because the city of Upper Arlington has insisted that that school's building be used for commercial activity um, to generate the most uh, revenue, tax revenue, for the city. They've required this and demanded this, even though the city's zoning code actually doesn't require it. And in fact, um, other nonprofit activities, such as a nonprofit daycare, would be able to <coughs> use this school's building um, without any problem under the code. This obviously is concerning and problematic for Tree of Life for a variety of reasons. Um, they don't care so much about the legal issues behind it, I do, but um, they're concerned about the fact that they have four separate campuses that they are currently hosting children at, and it has created a host of problems for them. You can just imagine if you're a parent and you have children um, of, in different grades, one at that campus, one at another, the difficulties that would be presented there, they're older buildings, so they're not able to, to you know, outfit them in the way that they would want to provide the level of education that they would like to provide in this newer building that they had purchased. Um, they've been losing students as a result of this. They've been inhibited in their ability to grow. Um, it's problematic and why ADF was interested in the case is because a RELUPA, which is, as Matt mentioned, the religious Land Use and Institutionalized Person Act is a religious liberty protection passed at the federal level that is precisely designed to prevent situations like this. And in a rare show of bipartisanship, although I guess it wasn't so rare when this was passed 18 years ago, um, RELUPA was passed virtually unanimously and, and, and signed by President Clinton, just like uh, RIFRA, the, the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, was. Um, and in RELUPA, they have an equal terms provision that says, essentially, that um, religious assemblies and institutions cannot be treated on less than equal terms with non-religious assemblies and institutions. Fairly straightforward, 
um, this was enacted and implemented after Congress had um, extensively studied and heard numerous people testify as to the pervasive nature of discrimination against religious groups, churches and religious organizations in land use decisions. And so they enacted RELUPA to put an end to this. Unfortunately, RELUPA, the, the promise of RELUPA to ensure equal treatment for churches and religious organizations has not been fully realized because the lower courts have not been interpreting it as it's been written. They've been adding extra requirements to the law that are not there in the text. And to simplify just how this is happening exactly is that the lower courts have said, okay, we see that it says non-religious assemblies and institutions, but we have to, to determine whether there's unequal treatment. We have to look at whether that non-religious assembly or institution is similarly situated. That's nowhere to be found in the statute, but the, the courts have seen fit to add it in. And then they said, to determine whether it's similarly situated, we need to look at the zoning purposes or the zoning criteria that the legislature or is trying to pursue or the city or county is trying to pursue in their zoning code. And then when we compare the criteria um, and how that applies to the non-religious assemblies and institutions, then we can determine whether there's unequal treatment. Um, these additional requirements have essentially robbed RELUPA of its force and what it was intended to do, and it's allowed local governments to really do as they like, and that's what has happened in Tree of Life's case. Um, Tree of Life, is litigation, their litigation has been ongoing for years. It went up to the Sixth Circuit three times, and most recently, um, the Sixth Circuit sided with the majority of the court appeals that have addressed, addressed this equal terms provision and added this additional requirement. They've added a requirement um, looking at the similarly situated piece and saying we're gonna view that in the context of legitimate zoning criteria. And when you do that in Tree of Life's case, they said, okay, yeah, there's nonprofit daycares that may be allowed to use Tree of Life's building, but when you look at how much tax revenue that they would raise, they would raise more than Tree of Life would using that building. Um, this resulted at the district court level, uh, really what amounted to a battle of experts, where we had to submit expert testimony trying to show no, in fact, Tree of Life would generate more income than, than a daycare would if they used a building. And so it just resulted in a battle of experts where the, the Sixth Circuit ultimately said, well, the city's expert, they didn't, they didn't actually rely on a city's expert, but they said, if you take the city's expert opinion and you take the Tree of Life's expert opinion, opinion, and we look at it, we think that there's not really unequal treatment going on. Um, there is a circuit split as to how to interpret the equal terms provision. They fall kind of in two camps. The one camp I described already, and that has to do with imposing the additional requirements on the law that aren't written in the text. The other, the other camp is a little bit more of a textualist approach. I say a little bit because they don't get it perfectly right. But the 11th Circuit kind of leads the way where they say, well, we look first, is there a non-religious assembly? Is there a non-religious institution allowed in the zoning district? If it is, and a religious assembly or institution is not, then you have your RELUPA equal terms violation. So we've, uh, Judge Thapar actually wrote a dissent in Tree of Life's case, um, and that dissent shed light on this. It, it, called, it called the courts out, it said, look, the, the circuit courts are, are fractured on this. The Supreme Court needs to weigh in. Um, and the lower courts are adding provisions and requirements to RELUPA that aren't there in the text. Um, the Congress knew what it was doing. It, it had the, the testimony, the evidence presented about the religious discrimination that was taking place in land use decisions, and they, they made it plain and straightforward for a reason. They were aware of the similarly situated um, idea from e Equal Protection uh, Clause jurisprudence. They were aware of that and they chose not to include it. So we shouldn't be adding it in. And that's precisely what we've asked the Supreme Court to do. We've, we've filed a cert petition asking them to clarify the circuit split that has fractured the lower courts um, and to apply RELUPA as Congress intended and to, uh, to restore the protection that Congress intended to do 18 years ago. Thank you, Jeremiah.
Um, I want to ask Philip uh, f to provide a little background. Philip filed an amicus brief uh, in the Tree of Life case. So one thing that we, we attempted, I was filing a, an amicus brief on behalf of uh, Citizens for Community Values, which is home base right here in Columbus. And the approach that we took was to, to demonstrate to the court, or try to show the Supreme Court, here's what's happening not just at the circuit court level, but most litigation ends in the district courts. Here's what the district courts are having to do uh, with this landscape of our lupa that, that frankly is not making any sense. Uh, I'm gonna bore you with a little bit of legislative history. My deepest apologies to Justice Scalia for that. Uh, but it's important to, to see what's why the situation in the lower courts is, is so chaotic. You first have to ask, well, what was our, our lupa supposed to do? Uh, and the problem that Congress identified was cities are using uh, these vague zoning criteria to exclude religious institutions uh, basically from any nice or desirable part of the city and in, in a lot of cases uh, exclude them from the city altogether. Uh, and they're relying on things like aesthetics. Uh, does your synagogue fit with the neighborhood? Uh, what are the traffic flow patterns? Uh, that kind of thing. And, and you, you'll see in the introductory statement from uh, Senators Hatch and Kennedy uh, when they're describing the problem, uh, they hit on a couple of pretty specific things. Uh, that you're seeing churches excluded from parts of a city where you might allow a theater, or churches are being forbidden from meeting in abandoned schools. Keep that in mind. Uh, what, as Jeremiah pointed out, what a lot of the circuits have, have said is they've, they've sort of kicked our loop as actual text and said, are these churches and these synagogues and these religious schools being treated less favorably than similarly situated comparators? Similarly situated as to what? Whatever zoning thing the city is trying to do. Well, what are the zoning things that cities are trying to do? They're looking at traffic, they're looking at aesthetics, uh, they're looking at fit with the neighborhood. The very things that our loop is designed to prevent them from doing, uh, now courts are saying are the actual measuring stick for whether or not loop of violations occur. Uh, so we pointed out three, I thought, pretty important district court cases uh, in our amicus brief. Now, the first was Emanuel Baptist versus the city of Chicago from 2017, and I apologize, I'm gonna lean on my notes because I am uh, a practitioner rather than an academic, and so I, I, I live and die with the legal pads. <laughs> but uh, in the Emanuel Baptist case, uh, the city had, had instituted uh, a zoning ordinance that required off-street parking for uh, religious institutions. And you had about 80 people meeting weekly in a 3,900 square foot church. Uh, and they, did not, they didn't have the space or the desire to sort of put in the off-street parking the city required. And they brought in our LUPA claim saying we're being treated less favorably than libraries in the city of Chicago which are not required to have off-street parking if they are less than 4,000 square feet. And interestingly, the court found in favor of the city and said, look, churches are more like movie theaters. Uh, the traffic patterns, you know, people all gathering at once and then leaving at once, uh, they're not really like libraries in terms of the traffic and parking needs. So that's not a good comparator. The church loses, you guys have to put in parking. Uh, then you have another Northern District of Illinois case, uh, Urshad versus the city of Dupin, uh, where a church wanted to meet in a house that had been converted into a school. I refer you back to our Hatch and Kennedy statement, a church that wants to meet in an abandoned school. And the city said, no, uh, your church is not like a school in the traffic patterns it generates uh, or in the frequency of its use. I confess, I don't know how a church that meets once a week uh, has sort of a less favorable usage pattern than a school where students are coming in, in and out every day, but that's what the court said. Uh, and the third one, uh, my personal favorite in the brief, was uh, Riverside Church versus the city of St. Michael in the District of Minnesota, uh, out in my, my old home, Eighth Circuit. A church bought a movie theater, and what they wanted to do, I know, right? They bought a movie theater in a commercial district and wanted to broadcast uh, their church services from kind of their home base campus onto one of the screens in the movie theater. And the city objected. Uh, and the problem, the, the city said, is that a church and a movie theater don't have the same traffic pattern. Uh, in fact, the city said, church is a little more like libraries. 
And, and I, I confess some shock that a district court actually bought the argument that a church that wants to broadcast a service on a screen in a movie theater is not similarly situated to that movie theater <laughs> broadcasting a movie on that screen. But in a regime where cities are basically allowed to manipulate their zoning criteria to exclude religious institutions from areas they don't happen to want institutions, these are the kinds of decisions you get. Uh, and so absent the Supreme Court kind of coming in and, and cleaning up the mess, you're going to continue to find that synagogues and mosques and religious schools are going to lose in hostile cities. Uh, basically, the only places where you'd see an Arlupa violation occur, they're going to lose because cities get to choose their own measuring stick. Uh, the Tree of Life case was, was a hilarious one because the school actually demonstrated they generate more tax revenue than a, than a daycare meeting in the same area. Uh, but they ended up losing the tax revenue standard because the city demonstrated they would generate less tax revenue per square foot of the building than a daycare that met in a smaller building. Uh, again, you're basically sort of, sort of seeing cities manipulate criteria to exclude religious institutions, which is exactly the problem our Lupa was designed to solve. Uh, so for that reason, we thought it's important for the Supreme Court to step in and say, look, Congress meant what it said. The text means things. If I could just add to that, I mean, I think one thing, um, kind of commenting back on the fact that RELUPA was passed almost unanimously 18 years ago, and I think, I'll, I'll just be candid, before I got involved in this work, you're, one would be reluctant to think that cities or, or the local government officials are deliberately um, discriminating against religious institutions. I mean, you go and you see churches and you think, well, it can't be that bad, there's churches here. Um, RELUPA actually has a separate provision to deal with express discrimination. You can't do that under RELUPA. The equal terms provision is separate. It doesn't, you don't have to show that they intended to discriminate. All you have to do is show that there's un unequal treatment going on. Um, but 18 years ago is very different than today. And uh, I think for the Supreme Court to step in now and provide some clear clarity and guidance to the lower courts is especially important because it is more likely today that a local government official would discriminate and do it in a way that doesn't appear to be discrimination by relying on these manipulable standards that the lower courts have said they can use. Great. Before we move on to the next topic, um, I just want to mention two things. First, I'm not skipping Holly, uh, not forgetting Holly. Um, her organization, um, I don't know that you're necessarily representing the organization, but they're not particularly involved in the <laughs> Tree of Life issue, so we're saving her for another part of the conversation. Um, I do want to mention in the Tree of Life case, um, there, the, the Sixth Circuit uh, found for the city of Upper Arlington, but there was a defense by Judge Thapar. Um, would either of you like to kind of comment on how that broke down? I'll just say it was a, an absolutely stellar dissent, and you can feel free to tell him I said that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, it was excellent. I, I would encourage you, um, if you're interested, to read it. Um, the beginning of that dissent, he really outlines the history of discrimination that takes place in these land use decisions, not just the religious discrimination, but going back and talking about the racial discrimination that took place and how it kind of starts um, overt and open and on its face of the statute. Um, and then as they get called on that by courts or the general public, that it becomes a little bit more um, covered up. Um, and he, he kind of highlights very persuasively how that happened with, in the context of race is exactly what was happening in the context of religion. Um, and that Congress knew that. This wasn't some, some law that was drawn out of thin air to, because it was popular, it was because there was a real problem and they were trying to address it and they tried to do it in straightforward, clear terms. And um, Judge Thapar basically says, look, um, be, as lower courts, you may not like the policy behind it. Maybe you fall into the camp where you think this isn't a real problem 
um, or something we need to be addressing. Maybe you don't think a, a religious school or church should be in that particular zoning district, but it's not our job as the, the judicial branch to impose our policy preference and, well, we need to interpret the law as it's written. So it really is an excellent um, dissent. And he basically invites um, Tree of Life to ask the Supreme Court to um, provide clarity. Let me say one, one quick word for the other side because they do happen to have the weight of a number of courts of appeals behind them and, and in the interest of, of being fair to the, the full debate of ideas, <clears throat> I have to concede in my heart of hearts the, the argument they make is not absurd. Uh, <clears throat> our LUPA does have the feel of an anti-discrimination law and that's, that's a large part of the argument you'll see. Uh, and, and so the question is, what does it mean to treat someone unequally? And you need kind of a rubric of equality to get there. And that's where you're seeing courts uh, really, frankly, struggling with, well, what's our rubric for deciding what unequal terms really means? Uh, and you will see courts basically reaching for what they know. They, judges are all former lawyers. Uh, and so they are, like practitioners, they are reaching for kind of their bag of expertise, and that's, well, what do we do in other discrimination cases? Well, let's read our LUPA that way. We happen to think they've made a mistake, but you know, just so you know, that, that's kind of the, the motivation of the, the other side of the argument. Okay. Well, thank you both. Um, the, the, the second topic that we wanted to address is the, um, the, the trend we've seen of a lot of litigation taking place nationwide, or at least um, debates, uh, over potential religious exemptions to statutes of general applicability. And I think uh, Jeremiah was going to kind of set the stage, and then we'll hear from Holly uh, with kind of a business perspective on some of those issues. Yeah, I, I think we, in some ways, we've already set the stage when talking about RIFRA and RELUPA and how they were largely uncontroversial about 20 years ago or so when they were um, enacted. It was nearly unanimous. Um, proposed by Democratic senators and House members, passed by, uh, you know, signed by a Democratic president. And you can fast forward to today and you compare that to similar efforts to pass religious freedom or religious uh, liberty protections at a statewide level and the controversy and the division that that brings. Um, I don't know if you all remember a few years ago the Indiana situation where Indiana tried to pass its own statewide um, religious freedom bill and it just went horribly um, and that's where they had people asking pizza parlors whether they would cater the same-sex wedding and I wanted to ask who in heaven's name caters pizza for their wedding but that's the types of questions that were being asked and it led to kind of sensational results and so what was once um, a consensus issue religious liberty should be protected rights of conscience should be protected uh, is less clear. There's no longer consensus on that. Um, and when you're talking about religious exemptions, um, there's kind of two categories that I would put it in. Um, you have the sexual orientation, gender identity legislation that's being introduced that would add sexual orientation, gender identity as protected classes to non-discrimination ordinances where a lot of this conflict is taking place. And then there's everything else. Um, I want to talk about everything else, but I, I, sadly, I think the, the SOGI issue is probably more interesting for all of you, and I know Holly has some good thoughts to share with the group there. Um, so I'll just touch on the SOGI piece, and if, there's, if time permits, I would maybe perhaps later talk about the religious exemptions in other areas and other contexts. Um, with the sexual orientation, gender identity, non-discrimination issue, um, I mean, I think it goes without saying, uh, but I'll say it anyway, that uh, everybody should be treated with dignity and respect, and that their you know, unjust, unfair discrimination is not a good thing. It's not something that should be advocated for. Um, but unfortunately, with these SOGI laws, what we see is that there is real harm that results to individuals um, as a result of these pieces of legislation. And I just want to touch on three kind of examples um, quickly. Um, the first is that these um, 
SOGI laws, they force people who, and business owners who willingly serve everybody to express messages and to participate um, and celebrate events that conflict with their religious beliefs. This is the Jack Phillips and Masterpiece Cake Shop that went up to the Supreme Court. This is Baronel Stutzman, who is a floral artist in uh, Washington who has been sued in her personal capacity as well as business capacity, um, and it's gone all the way to the Washington Supreme Court. Baronel's case, I think, is um, illustrative of our, our, our other clients that we represent in this area in that Baronel, for almost 10 years, served a man, um, his name is Rob Ingersoll, who um, is a, a openly um, gay man, identifies as being gay. Um, she served him for years um, in a variety of contexts, did floral arrangements for him for birthdays, other celebrations, no problem, enjoyed doing work for him, considered him to be a friend. Um, but one day, Rob came in and asked Baronel to do um, the floral arrangements for his same-sex wedding. This was a difficult decision for Baronel um, because she had developed a friendship with him. Um, but as a good Southern Baptist, she did not feel as though in good conscience she could um, participate and celebrate that event, to use her creative talents to create custom pieces of floral artwork um, for this, this event. So she told him that in as loving and kind of way as possible. Um, actually referred him to four other florists that she knew would do a good job for Rob, um, and they hugged and left. Um, the Washington Attorney General, however, got wind that this happened and decided to go after Baronel. Um, so despite the fact that Baronel served him in all these other contexts, and it had nothing to do with providing service, but it had to do with her uh, not being able to express messages that she disagrees with and celebrate events that uh, violate her beliefs, these SOGI laws are being used to attack people like Baronel. Um, another area is that SOGI laws create harm is they violate the bodily privacy of women and girls. And uh, an example of this is a case where we're representing uh, Downtown Hope Center in Anchorage, Alaska. It's a, a, a ministry, a Christian ministry that serves and takes care of both men and women who are having difficult times and are homeless, provides food, um, education, um, professional type of resources to help them get back on their feet. One part of their ministry, though, is that they have an overnight shelter specifically for women. Uh, many of these women who happen to have been sexually abused or victims of domestic violence, um, they, ha they all stay in one room. Um, they have mattresses on the floor. There's about three feet of separation between the, the, the mattresses, and it's limited to women for obvious reasons. Um, one night, a, um, a biological male who identifies as female came and asked to use the overnight shelter. Um, he was inebriated and injured, um, so Downtown Hope Center told him, no, you can't stay here tonight, but they paid for a taxi to take him to get some medical um, treatment to, to be taken care of. Well, the city of Anchorage has gone after Downtown Hope Center, saying that they violate, they have violated the um, city ordinance prohibiting gender identity discrimination. So there's another example of the harm it causes. And the last thing I'd like to point out, because this is happening all across the country and um, is, seems to be in the news on a weekly basis, if not daily basis now, is the um, foster care situation and how these um, SOGI laws actually hurt children in the foster care system. Um, and we're seeing that states are imposing these SOGI non-discrimination provisions to force out um, religious um, nonprofits who do foster care and adoption work and have so done so successfully and without problem for many, many years. We're representing a, an adoption provider in New York right now in a federal lawsuit who was told that they need to shut down or change their beliefs about marriage and begin placing with same-sex couples. This despite the fact that they've been doing this ministry for over 50 years, don't take a penny of the state's money, not a single penny, so that they could maintain their autonomy, their religious autonomy to operate their ministry according to their faith.
but yet they're being told they need to stop as a result of the state's SOGI uh, non-discrimination requirement. Um, unfortunately, I don't see a end in sight. This is going to continue until we receive some sort of resolution, perhaps by the Supreme Court, as to how to handle these difficult issues. Um, proponents of SOGI laws are not um, keen on providing religious exemptions. Um, we see that most recently uh, with the introduction of the Equality Act uh, in Congress, the U.S. Congress, which would add sexual orientation and gender identity to a variety of federal laws, including Title VII, um, employment discrimination, um, and it does not contain a single, single religious exemption, not even for churches. Um, on top of that, it would scale back the protections provided by the federal RIFRA law and say that you could not use RIFRA to, as a defense for any claim of SOGI discrimination. So um, this is a battle that's going to continue. It's obviously a hot topic, um, and I have lots more to say about it, which I'm sure I'll have the chance to say. Holly, would you like to, as Jeremiah just said, there's, there, there is concern um, from some quarters about some of these exception, and I'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah, um, thanks for um, inviting me to join this panel, and thank you to everybody. Um, so, you know, my work as an advocate for the business community is focused on a legislative strategy in um, advancing statewide non-discrimination protections for LGBT individuals. And that's what I'll focus on today. Um, I think it'd be interesting to first let you know why the business community has really emerged as an ally on this issue. There's a couple of reasons that I'd like to highlight. Um, and this would add um, those non-discrimination protections in employment, housing, and in place of public accommodation. So um, why do employers care about it beyond their places of employment? I think that piece of this is really important. So um, many employers have begun to enact these internal policies protecting their workers. It's those external locations that they really have no control over that are sometimes problematic. Um, when we recruit a worker to come to Ohio, or retain a worker um, to stay here in Ohio. We want them to bring their best selves to the workplace. And when the, they or their family members are facing discrimination in um, housing or in places where they receive services, they simply cannot bring their most productive selves to the workplace. And that can cause issues for employers as well. So employers, uh, they also, it's incredibly low unemployment right now, um, a booming economy, and the top challenge that we hear from employers is a challenge in finding workers. So with this war for talent, employ the employer community is really supporting policies that help them attract in, in, in that attraction and retention. They want to support policies that help them attract and retain. We know that uh, millennials, more than any generation before them, want to work in a place that shares their values. And they, uh, millennials, more than any generation before them, care about this issue, whether or not they personally identify as a member of the LGBT community. We also think this improves our economic competitiveness as a state when we're inclusive and welcoming. When I worked on the mission to bring Amazon HQ2 to the city of Columbus, we know for a fact that the Amazon team asked the question of what the state's non-discrimination protections look like, and we could not answer that in a way that they were happy with. We have those protections here in the city of Columbus um, that we're really proud of, but again, those statewide protections are not in place, and when you're recruiting about 50,000 workers as they were going to, we know that they're gonna live um, and their family members will live and work outside of the boundaries of the city. Um, you know, we, you mentioned, Jeremiah, uh, for a moment, the, uh, the, on the other side of that is the negative economic impact 
of laws, RIFRA, RIFRA laws or bathroom bill laws um, in Indiana and also in North Carolina, the, esti the estimated economic impact of the North Carolina bathroom bill that forced the final four to relocate was um, $3.7 billion. So we in Ohio, we, as a business community, we wanna prevent that as much as possible. And then we also know that it helps to improve the image and from a marketing perspective of businesses. Um, it helps them expand their customer base and improve client relations. And finally, it'll provide some legal certainty. Um, we have uh, seen some conflicting uh, case law on this issue, and um, right now we have a piecemeal approach to these ordin local ordinances. We have um, 20 states plus the District of Columbia, I believe, that have enacted these statewide protections. And then here in Ohio, a number of jurisdictions, the city of Columbus, Bexley, have enacted the policies, but again, um, it varies across the, the jurisdictions. So as it relates to, I wanna talk for a second about Masterpiece. Um, you know, it was our reading of Masterpiece that um, these anti-discrimination statutes are really uncontroversial and that legislatures can feel free to move forward and enact them. In that case, um, we saw that the petitioner was in fact treated um, with hostility towards his religion. And so the, while it was a, a law of general applicability, <coughs> excuse me, it was implied in a hostile manner. And that's what was at issue here. It wasn't that the, the law itself was at issue. And so um, Justice Kennedy makes it very clear that LGBT people, and I just want to read a quote from the case, cannot be treated as social outcasts or as inferior in dignity and worth. And for that reason, the Constitution can, and in some instances, must protect them. So these laws are not per se unconstitutional and in fact were deemed in that case specifically unexceptional and that's why we're um, pursuing the uh, Ohio Fairness Act here in Ohio and believe that it will withstand constitutional muster. Um, I'll, I'll follow up with a couple of you um, just to, to play devil's advocate with both of you. Um, I'll start with Holly. Um, you know, Businesses are used to um, dealing with employment laws that are generally applicable, that um, you know, oftentimes require the employer to undertake individualized inquiries in order to arrive at a reasonable accommodation. We can think of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, we can think of uh, various leave laws uh, that can be viewed essentially as a reasonable accommodation. Uh, you can think about um, any number of statutes, including actually in the religious context, where employers are called upon to deal with an employee as they are who has a concern um, or a problem that they need to deal with, and the employer is asked to treat them differently uh, than other employees in removing some general requirement that the employer may have, whether it's attendance or, or uh, the requirement to lift a, a, an object above a certain amount of weight or whatever it might be. And so employers have gotten, I think, used to um, engaging in those types of individual inquiries that result sometimes in exceptions. Now, wh what, if anything, is there that's different um, about the um, SOGI law context that would um, suggest that an employer should not also uh, be able to make uh, certain exceptions uh, or accommodations for employees with religious uh, objections or concerns? I would say that it's um, because in the instances where they're making an accommodation, that's usually to benefit the employee. Um, in this instance, the, the accommodation that you're, that you're seeking would be um, to permit the discrimination against a customer. 
Um, and so, you know, we've taken a stand as a business community that when you open your doors to the public, you open them to all. Okay. Well, in Jeremiah, um, if we go back to Employment Division v. Smith, um, which was actually authored by Justice Scalia, um, we saw a concern by Justice Scalia with laws of general applicability um, uh, being essentially set aside in individual circumstances in a way that's maybe not reflected in current uh, litigation efforts on the right. Um, at what point um, can you address Holly's concern that, that there has to be a certain point at which uh, you know, exceptions can't uh, be given um, to uh, people for religious reasons, or maybe there's situations that arise. Where do you draw the line and when is it, for in your, in your, uh, from a litigation perspective, when is it permissible for a court to offer or, or to require an exception to be made and when is it not? Well, so Employment Division v. Smith was, you know, in my view, um, it's a bad ruling. Um, I look forward to the day when it's overturned, hopefully. Um, I think I think the answer is to treat um, free exercise the same as you treat the other First Amendment freedoms. It's treated kind of on a second tier ta status where even though everyone sees that there's a burdening of religion going on or someone's religious rights are being violated, um, <clears throat> that it somehow is only subject to rational basis review because the law is generally applicable or neutral, which courts you know, interpret a wide variety of ways. You know, we have cases where courts take that standard and it basically boils down to if you can't show that there is some sort of like invidious, intentional religious discrimination, then you lose, which I don't think is what Justice Scalia intended with Smith, but that's kind of how it's playing out in the lower courts. I think the solution is just go back to the standard that existed pre-Smith. Um, and I didn't see the, the sky falling or the world being a horrible place because there was a compelling interest test or strict scrutiny applied to free exercise claims. Just because strict scrutiny is applied, yeah, it's a rigorous test, but it should be. When you're talking about violations of people's First Amendment freedoms, it should be. Um, the government should have to justify why it's doing it, doing it. And maybe they can succeed in some of these instances, but um, that's the standard that should be in place, not a, you know, rational basis standard that um, seems to apply any time a religious freedom claim comes up, except in the most rarest extreme examples. One, one thought general to the topic. <clears throat> to, to echo something that, that Jeremiah had said, one foundational point here that I think we all agree on is that nobody is pro-discrimination. Uh, and that by and large, when you're looking at, at SOGI laws, I, I think one of my former colleagues had described it as, as a solution in, in search of a problem in the sense that uh, this is not like trying to dismantle Jim Crow where you, where you have sort of a group of people who are committed to discrimination. That's not the situation we're dealing with here. Uh, and so the concern that you tend to see out of religious dissenters is that these SOGI laws, which by and large they would often be fine with, are being weaponized against religious dissenters. It's being, they're being used uh, to bring your Arlene Flowers and your Masterpiece Cake Shops and your Lyceums to heal on sort of the, the current sexual zeitgeist. Uh, the concern that raises is that in every other context, we believe that institutions can have an institutional identity and a, a set of institutional values. Uh, to give you one example, Patagonia announced, uh, this is a, an apparel company, uh, announced a few weeks ago that they're taking a, a, a new look at some of the co-branding that they'll do for some of their best. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Patagonia makes a particular uh, fleece vest that is kind of the uniform of uh, finance bros. <laughs> so if you, if you are around my age and you work Wall Street or Wall Street adjacent, you own a Patagonia vest that has the Patagonia logo on one side and your company's logo on the other. Uh, Patagonia said, look, we're, we're going to take a look at some of these mass orders that we're, we're issuing, uh, and we're not going to make these vests for companies that don't align with our values. 
and we're basically fine with that state of affairs. Uh, they're going to focus on co-branding with what they call certified B organizations. That are, those are businesses that have a particular kind of environmental bend. We are fine with Patagonia having an institutional identity wrapped around its relationship with the environment. If you've ever walked into a Starbucks, there's a feel to a Starbucks that is different from other coffee shops. And that's on purpose and we're perfectly fine with that. I mean, the CEO of Starbucks is running for president on the platform of look at the culture I have built in my company. And so the question that a lot of religious dissenters are asking with uh, religious exemptions from otherwise generally applicable laws, uh, and SOGI laws in particular, is are religious institutions also permitted to maintain an institutional religious identity and are we allowed to have policies that allow us to keep that? So are we allowed to have hiring policies that allow us to retain, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice for no reason. Or, you know, if I operate a Catholic school, am I allowed to have a hiring policy where I require teachers who act and behave and teach consistently with my Catholic mission? If I operate a mosque, am I allowed to hire staff that reflects the religious identity of my mosque. Under any number of, of iterations of SOGI laws, the answer to that question is no. Uh, and that's why you see these institutions asking for basically the same freedom to retain institutional identity that we're comfortable granting to anybody else. Right. Can I add something Please. in response to that? So, you know, the Ohio Fairness Act um, it would maintain all of the religious protections that are currently afforded in the Ohio and the U.S. Constitution. So the ministerial exemption, for example, would remain in place. I know that some states have gone <coughs> far, farther in trying to peel that back, but that's not the case in the Ohio version. Um, and then, you know, I think that I would probably disagree with that notion um, that there's not some in intentional discrimination involved with the business owners. Um, I think we have, in some instances, on these unfortunate instances, seen religious freedom laws being used, these laws that were intended to protect religious freedoms, being used as a sword to commit discrimination. Um, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission receives a number of complaints every year that they simply cannot adjudicate because the law doesn't allow them to. There's a, a couple points on, on that. So, um, you know, the first I just want to highlight, I mentioned already, the clients that we represent, they serve everybody. It's just particular messages and events that they cannot participate in. Um, so the fact that Amazon may want a statewide SOGI, I don't understand why that means Jack Phillips and Baronell have to participate in a same-sex wedding. I don't understand why that means Blaine Adamson, who hires LGBT people, has to make T-shirts for a um, gay pride parade. Um, so, uh, you know, let's let's make sure the distinctions there are are clear. Um, you know, that we we mentioned masterpiece. There's, I think, a few takeaways from masterpiece, although um, it didn't. It didn't definitively resolve this issue. I think we all know that. Um, there's a few takeaways we can we can have from it. And, and the first is that hostility towards religion has no place in our society. Um, that the distinctions do matter that I was talking about. The the fact that you know you serve the customers in other contexts, but it's just when you're talking about a message or event, you can't promote that. That matters. And that tolerance is a, a two-way street. That you have to um, be tolerant and respectful. Um, and twice now, the Supreme Court, both in Obergefell and Masterpiece on this very issue, said that people of good faith um, believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that, that needs to be respected and actually protected. Obergefell says that, that those beliefs deserve proper protection. All right, well, thank you. Holly mentioned um, the, the Ohio uh, bill that's working its way through the legislature. And that, I think, is a good way to bring us to our third point, which is that if you look at Article I, uh, Section 7 of the Ohio Constitution, the language on religious uh, freedom or, or protection of religion is very different than the language under uh, the First Amendment. Philip, can you comment on that and kind of 
give us a little background on what that may mean? Sure. So, so the Ohio Constitution, uh, I, I'm going to read Section 7 to you, just so you can kind of get a sense for the difference between the First Amendment and, and the Ohio Constitution. All men have a natural and indefeasible right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience. No person shall be compelled to attend, erect, or support any place of worship, or maintain any form of worship against its consent. No preference shall be given by law to any religious society, nor shall any interference with the rights of conscience be permitted. No religious test shall be required as a qualification for office, nor shall any person be incompetent to be a witness on account of his religious belief. But nothing herein shall be construed to dispense with oaths and affirmations. Religion, morality, and knowledge, however, being essential to good government, it should be the duty of the General Assembly to pass suitable laws to protect every religious denomination in the peaceable enjoyment of its own mode of public worship and to encourage schools and the means of instruction. That is not uh, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Uh, fortunately for, for those of us or those of you who live in Ohio, I unfortunately I live on the Kentucky side of the, of the Ohio River, uh, Ohio does not interpret Section 7 sort of in lockstep with the way that the federal First Amendment is interpreted. Uh, and, and I think that's important for a few reasons, one of them which is near and dear to all of our hearts in the Federalist Society, and that is the text of the two provisions are different. And one of our principles is that words mean things, uh, and different words mean different things. This is not, con not a controversial topic. Uh, and so it, it is important to give sort of full flavor and effect to the words that the Ohio legislature uh, and the people of Ohio have chosen to use. And so the, the Ohio Supreme Court has opined that the federal First Amendment is sort of the floor of religious freedom below which the state cannot go, but it's not the ceiling. And, and one of the reasons I think this is important, and, and it's important that state constitutions uh, be given sort of their own flavor and interpretation generally, uh, and to this I tip my hat to, to Judge Sutton, is that it allows for uh, a sort of federalism experimentation. Uh, that is, you allow states and individuals in states to figure out how they want to order their communities. Uh, you can choose whether you want more or less robust religious protections, and in the US, that's basically fine. Uh, as long as you're sort of maintaining the play between the joints of the, of the federal free exercise uh, and establishment clauses, order your communities as you want. Uh, this is especially important in states like Ohio that have elected or electorally responsive judiciaries. Uh, it, it, it really does kind of emphasize that right of the people of a state to decide how they want to live. Uh, another is that the interpretation of the federal constitution tends to shift uh, with the personnel of the court. And I am not convinced that any particular state Supreme Court, when it's signed on to uh, the, f when the states that have sort of a lockstep uh, interpretation where they say you interpret our religion clause the way that the federal courts interpret the federal counterpart, I don't think any of those state judiciaries were thinking, and we're fine with that today, and we're fine with how that might look under a different regime in 20 years. So we signed on to lockstep before Employment Division v. Smith, and we're perfectly fine with the new regime afterwards. Uh, but sort of a, a lockstep interpretation really doesn't allow states to give their own constitutions uh, full flavor and effect. Uh, and finally, you've got states with lots of interesting and unique histories when it comes to religious liberty. Uh, so Rhode Island, Utah, and Maryland might have a very different approach to what religious freedom ought to look like than some of their neighboring states. Utah being home to uh, a national religious minority that basically got chased across a third of the country uh, might take freedom of conscience a little differently than Virginians who never had to move. Uh, Maryland, as it establishes a refuge for Catholics that were unwelcome everywhere else in the country, might take a different view of establishment uh, than their colleagues in New York. And so allowing different language and different state constitutions to have their full flavor, uh, I think allows a state to be responsive to its own sort of unique circumstances and unique history. I want to be mindful of time for questions. We have about 10 minutes left, but 
Philip and Holly, I'm sorry, Jeremiah and Holly, do you have any comments before we move to questions? The, the only thing I, I would add, um, I, you know, we don't, our organization doesn't necessarily dive deep on how should the state Supreme Court interpret its own state constitution, but I, just because we've been talking about Smith and the fact that some states do follow Smith, I do think it's important to point out that in, in recent history, when the Supreme Court has been given the opportunity to follow Smith, it hasn't necessarily done so. So I'm thinking um, the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision, that you could argue fits within a Smith framework, but um, they didn't apply strict scrutiny like Smith would indicate it should have. Trinity Lutheran, um, same thing. Um, Hosanna Tabor, which is a ministerial exception case where they specifically indicated, look, we're not applying Smith to tell a religious institution that they you know, who they can hire and fire as their ministers. Um, so we do see some retreat from the Supreme Court on that case law as well. I mean, I think it would be interesting to see if the Ohio Fairness Act were to pass and were challenged in the, by, in the Ohio Supreme Court, um, how that would play out given the Humphrey v. Lane ruling. Um, certainly, you know, we do believe that the law is crafted in a way that it will pass constitutional muster, even the Ohio Constitution. Um, but I do think that that's certainly, it would be interesting to see. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hi there. Um, I actually don't live in Ohio. Uh, I live in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. And I'm curious to know if the Ohio Chamber of Commerce wants uh, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Mormons, and anyone else who holds to traditional religious views to be able to have their best day at work. Of course. Um, so just to clarify. <laughs> I, I, I'm here representing the Columbus Chamber of Commerce, not the Ohio Chamber, but I will add a caveat that the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, for the first time in the legislation's history, did sign on as a proponent to the bill. Um, but of course, and I think that's the tough conversation here, right, is that balance um, between religious liberties and civil rights. Go ahead. Holly, I have a question. Um, I'm a little confused. Uh, you said the biggest problem that employers have is a lack of employees. Um, that's their biggest problem. Yet, the Columbus Chamber of Commerce is in favor of giving huge subsidies to Amazon to bring 50,000 jobs to Columbus to make that issue worse. Is that, I mean, just confused. But my question is, um, it sounds like uh, the Columbus Chamber of Commerce is uh, willing to give up people's religious liberty in favor of um, basically um, business, improving business in the community. I think that was your basic argument, that this is good for business if we re, you know, get rid of religious people's religious liberty. Uh, I mean, you could have said in the same thing in 1850 that slavery was a good thing because it was good for business. And a lot of plantation owners actually believe that. So I, I'm really confused on your position on that. So, you know, I think the distinction there is that we believe what's good for, dis for business is when all employees and all Ohioans are protected equally against discrimination. You know, for us, it's. Um, of course, that's important. Um, but you know, we feel that it's a balance between religious liberties and um, and civil rights. And you know, the courts have ruled that that balance in laws, generally applicable laws, um, they can, in fact. Uh, sometimes infringe upon First Amendment rights, and it's the balance that we need to be careful of. I, I want to jump in and, and just reiterate something I said earlier, uh, which is that we are not dealing with dismantling Jim Crow, and that goes both ways. Uh, 
I mean, neither on the pro-exemption side nor on the pro-SOGI side are we talking about a situation that approximates Jim Crow or slavery. And, and, and so I'll just say, I, I think this is a topic that more or less has to be dealt with on its own merits. Next question. Um, yes, I, it's hard to strike the balance. I know the Roman emperors were very tolerant of religions. All they needed to do was have a little incense to the god of the emperor, and you didn't need to mean it. And maybe you could even have somebody else do that, although some Christians had a different view of, of where the, the line was drawn. Um, I would note that the Ohio Supreme Court, we alluded to our Article uh, 1, Section 7, but in Humphrey versus Lane, in a 2000 case uh, that was decided by the Ohio Supreme Court right after the Smith case, or, or the, rather the case that knocked down RIFRA as applied to the states for federalism reasons, basically said that under uh, Section 7, Article 1 of the Ohio Constitution, the standard for reviewing a generally applicable religion-neutral state regulation that allegedly violates a person's right to free exercise of religion is whether the regulation serves a compelling state interest and is the least restrictive means of furthering that issue. Thus, for example, if you would apply that standard to a, someone who is not wanting to do photography for a gay wedding or cakes or whatever, uh, the state would have an interest in ensuring that they would have access to photography and to cakes. They would not have an interest, or the least restrictive means of achieving that interest would not be to compel a particular person to perform that function, assuming it were otherwise readily available. Uh, the question I have for the panel is, do, does everyone agree or is there a disagreement about whether or not the standard in Ohio at least should be uh, compelling state interest and the least restrictive means of achieving that interest uh, when the free exercise of religion is allegedly violated. Who wants to take that? I, I, I'll, I'll make this observation. Uh, as, as someone who was a big fan of the pre-Smith test uh, under the, the federal First Amendment, even sort of a, a, an adoption of that test by the Ohio Supreme Court doesn't really look like it tracks with the language of Article One, Section 7, which is to say it's just, the, it is the court grabbing a different version of the federal standard. We like the federal standard from 1980 more than we like the federal standard from 2010. And, and I'm not sure that is advancing the ball much on giving state constitutions their own sort of full flavor, effect, and reading. Uh, so while Personally, I'm a fan of the test that, that Ohio has adopted. Uh, I think there's still some value in, in actually stopping to say, well, what does our text and the history of our state actually compel? Uh, what was the Ohio populace trying to do when, when they passed this provision? So, you know, I think in that case, if I think about how it might be applied to the Ohio Fairness Act were it to pass, or some of these, um, Jeremiah, we didn't talk about the, um, a complaint was just filed in, um, remind me the municipality. South Euclid. South Euclid. Euclid. South Euclid. Yeah. Um, against a local anti-discrimination ordinance in Northeast Ohio. Um, so, you know, the, the, um, the Humphrey v. Lane standard is, will likely be applied if that case moves forward. You know, I think the question is, is the Ohio Fairness Act or is this local ordinance drafted to protect against a compelling government interest of preventing against discrimination? Um, and is it the least restrictive means of furthering that interest? I would say that it is. Um, I, I know that there's some disagreement there, of course, but um, you know we firmly believe that it is drafted in a way that that would pass um, that Humphrey v. Lane standard. Jeremiah, do you have any final comments before you close? Sure. I, I mean, I, just given some of the, the questions, I, I do want to highlight kind of what I think is one of the takeaways from the masterpiece decision. That is, tolerance is a two-way street, and I do believe that there's people goodwill on both sides of this issue, particularly the, the SOGI issue, um, and, and looking at whether, you know, 
I don't think there's necessary people on the other side. There are some, but not all, that are after religious people. Um, just like I think people on the other side are not hateful bigots because they don't want to participate in a same-sex wedding. So, uh, you know, in the context of, a, of this very important discussion and, and how do we balance um, these competing interests, uh, you know, I want to encourage all of us to remember that um, and, and to have as, as civil and polite a de debate on the issues as possible. Well, I see there's a couple more questions. However, we are over time, so I'm sure they would be great questions, but it's 4.45 on a Friday and we have a reception, so <laughs> I'm not stupid enough to keep going. Um,